is Henry. He is a compilation of a lot of people I have seen over the years. Henry was a retired 75-year-old man who was a bachelor living in a rural Midwest area. His son noticed a general decline in Henry's well-being, such as long, ungroomed beard, dirty fingernails, foul odor, dirty dishes throughout the house, and a pile of bills that seemed to be unopened. Henry was not driving into town as much as he had done previously. He did manage to drive to his annual doctor's appointment with his primary care physician, who noticed the lack of self-care. Henry's vital signs assessment and lab tests show no concerning active disease process. So, screen for depression, yes. Type as fast as you can. There's no wrong answer. MSE. What am I looking at? What is MSE? I'm not recognizing the acronym. I'm sorry. Go ahead and keep typing. Keep typing. Referral to social services. Mm -hmm. Able to consent to services. Mental screening, cognitive screening. Yes. Yes. Social services. Look at home support. Absolutely. Yeah. In, in our ECHO presentation, we're under a grant that really focuses on the four M's of geriatric care. What matters? Mentation, medication, and mobility. Of the four M's, which ones are indicated in this scenario? Go ahead and type in the chat box. Which ones might be indicated in this scenario? What matters? Mentation, medication, and mobility. If you can type in, what do you think? All of them. All. All. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I would agree with you. So the objectives is that we'll utilize a bank of evidence-based assessment for functional performance in basic ADLs identify evidence-based assessments for instrumental activities of daily living, and implement therapeutic communication during assessment to support collaboration and trust with older adults. So let's differentiate briefly between the BADLs and IADLs. I think you all know this, but I still put it on the screen. The basic ADLs are your basic self-care, like dressing, hygiene, grooming. IADLs are your instrumental ones like cooking, home care, laundry, community mobility, et cetera. So here's an overarching statement of need, and this comes right from the literature. There is a need for skill development of healthcare providers and interprofessional teams to assess basic ADLs and instrumental ADLs with therapeutic communication. So what is the reason that the literature is saying there's a need for ongoing education like this particular session? Well, um, this is where Kalindi Raichi really did a really nice paper on this in OT practice. Um, there's a lot of evidence about self-care neglect, and they called it a phenomenon um, where people just stop caring for themselves. So it's re refusal or inability to care and protect oneself for food, clothing, hygiene, medication, home safety, um, et cetera. Now, this is interesting. Approximately 1.2 million cases um, are reported of self-care neglect. However, I think the, the incidence is much higher than that, just by my own experience, but also by the next bullet. Because people with self-care neglect often refuse health care services. They refuse health care services. So what do you think is the reason for this? What is the reason that people with self-care neglect tend to refuse healthcare services? Can you type in the chat box or speak it? You can just speak if you want to unmute. Lack of insight. Yep, they might not be aware. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've been in the hospital. Oh, you are in the hospital. Uh, fear of loss of independence. Yes, fear. I think fear is a big one. Absolutely. So in my experience, um, they're afraid that they're going to get found out and they're afraid that people are going to put them in a nursing home. Here is, uh, are some of the contributing factors that Kalindi found in the literature. Um, contributing factors to self-care and life. Decrease in executive functioning, such as um, sequencing, planning, and problem solving. Increased levels of pain. Pain inhibits functional performance. 
rates of depression, somebody typed in that, that Henry might be experiencing depression. Absolutely. Um, there is increased risk of morbidity or mortality, such as um, complicated medical conditions or comorbidities. And higher rates of hospitalization are correlated with, with a lack of self-care because they have a lot of things to take care of in the, with um, health management. So regarding IADLs, some of the determinants are low financial status, um, determinants of low functioning with their instrumental IDLs is their financial status, um, social isolation, unsafe living conditions, and actually hoarding behaviors can be a sign of self-care neglect. Self-care neglect also leads to poor nutritional status. Do we have any nutritionists here or nurses in particular? Well, if they have self-care neglect, if they have any difficulty in making healthy meals, they're going to have nutritional deprivation. So there are barriers in the literature, um, barriers that impede or influence uh, self-care neglect. And it's really important that we address these barriers. So inefficient knowledge and awareness, and somebody already said that lack of awareness of the patient, but also um, it's hard for us to know how to address hygiene because it's a sensitive topic. It's hard to express concern that someone may have impaired hygiene because of the social norms associated with being clean, dry, and oil free. There may be limited resources and training supports for medical personnel. If you think about the rural aspect of North Dakota and somebody living out in a very rural area that's two hours away from healthcare facility, it's hard to get people to them to help address the self-care neglect. The efficient evidence for assessing risk factors, we have some really good assessment tools, but how do we look at some of the risk factors that contribute to self-care neglect? And then an absence of reliable, valid, and culturally sensitive assessment tool for self-care neglect. So this is where, if we don't have a specific tool, we're going to really pay attention to the assessment process with the tools that we do have. So I'm going to be talking about the assessment process and then the specific tools. Now, in my experience, the number one reason that people I've worked with um, de decline healthcare services to address self-care neglect is because they're afraid someone will put them in the nursing home. They don't know that it's illegal to just put somebody in a nursing home against their will. So so they worry about that because most people do want to stay in their own home, unlike Henry or case study. So it is problematic because there are things in their home that could be very hazardous that could be easily remedied with a simple adaptation. For example, they might be at a serious risk of falls with hygiene or getting in and out of the tub. And if I put a tub bench in and teach them how to sit on the tub and then swing their legs over so they don't have to step over the touch tub, um, it can make a huge difference. But they don't know that. They might think I'm coming in there to say, oh, you can't bathe, you have to go to nursing home. And that's not the case. So therefore, we need to go back to the process for assessment. So back to our overarching statement of need, there is a need for interprofessional assessments of ADL and IADL functional performance in order to adequately address aging in place needs of older adults. So I'm primarily addressing aging in place in community settings for older adults. However, much of this information can transfer to skilled nursing facilities as well, because you want them to be as independent as possible for their overall quality of life, well-being, or the fact that they might get discharged home from the skilled nursing facility. Um, and just a little side note, it's interesting. I was really surprised to see that only 5% of older adults are actually living in skilled nursing facilities. I thought it was really low because that's where I work. So I thought everybody was there. But it's kind of eye opening. So it kind of justifies the need to address community. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about the process for assessing self-care. 
So of course we take their social and medical histories. This is really important because maybe they've lost their social environment. And because of that, they're having a decline in self-care or the medical histories. Maybe there's something new coming about that's making a particular ADL task difficult. Um, their motivations and self-perceptions. This is the most important thing of the process. What is their motivation? What do they want? And what do they perceive as the barriers to their goal? If you can tap into their motivations and their perceptions and their perceived barriers, they will trust you and they will accept your help. I do a lot of home evaluations, but I do not call them home evaluations when I'm with the, the clients that I'm serving. Home evaluations are very important, but I call them home visits with them to address their goals and what they want. Um, even the word evaluation turns people off and makes them scared. Nobody wants to be evaluated. I don't think anybody in this room feels like being evaluated. So um, I'm pretty careful not to use that word with them. And then we want to assess their functional capacity. That's all their ADL group and IADL performance. But we're looking at their physical function, their emotional function, their cognitive function. So it's important to integrate all of those types of assessment tools. I'm going to be focusing on the function, the ADLs, the, IA, the basic ADLs and IADLs for assessment tools today. So the first part of the process is the therapeutic questioning, which helps them feel heard and understood. And once they have that, it makes them trust the provider. So we want to start with how or what, or I'd like to know more about what can you tell me about? Then they get a choice. They get to tell you what they want to tell you right now. If they want to tell you more later, if they start trusting you, they might. And then I always paraphrase, restate what they said. It's a simple tool, but it works like a charm and it builds instant trust. And then reflection, identify the feeling behind what they said. So it sounds like you're feeling frustrated with, um, is that correct? I like to follow up and ask them if that if my understanding is correct. And those reflection statements about, about their feelings are really profound. They go, if I'm right, if I'm if I'm reflecting on them correctly, they say, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and they get excited and they instantly trust me. And I never, ever, ever, ever ask why. Never ask why, because it raises defenses. I know it's it's um it's a uh, counseling psychological psychology 101 practice, but people always ask why. And we need to erase that from our vocabulary when we're with clients. Um, why questions lead to defensiveness, which makes them mistrust us. So instead, we say, what kind of barriers make it hard to do this? Create three questions, actually. One question, type in the chat box or speak it out loud. A question that the primary care physician can ask Henry that starts with how or what. What is new with you since I saw you last time? Beautiful open-ended question. What has changed recently in your daily life? Oh, I like that. Yeah, what has changed is very powerful. How do you feel about how things are going at home? I love that. These are better ones than I came up with, so that's this is great. What's the long-term goal related to healthcare? How can I help you achieve that? Beautiful. Absolutely. Here's what the doctor said. Henry, I'm concerned about you feeling isolated out in the country and how that might affect your emotional well-being. How would you describe your feelings? Henry described a typical day and, and sadly said that he felt lonely. And not everybody will come out and say that, but a lot of people will. It's surprising how many people I've seen that actually tell me that I'm not getting lonely out there. And the doctor said, loneliness can make a person feel sad. That's a beautiful, reflective statement. And I have seen healthcare providers share that. Yeah, loneliness can make a person feel sad. And Henry said adamantly, it sure does. So then he asked Henry what his goal was. So here's the issue. And, and then what do you want? Henry said, I used to want to stay in my home until I die, but now I'm thinking, 
that might be a lonely way to live now that I don't feel comfortable driving anymore. And now that I don't get around much, I can't get around much. It seems like I'm getting weaker. I kind of wonder if I could get better if I move to town where there's more to do. And I can't see people say this. They are kind of ready to move to town where there are more people because they can't get around. And it gets, you know, what used to be fun, like mowing the lawn, is not as much fun anymore. Now, there are some people that love it and they want to stay there to the end. And all the more power to them. But this particular case, Henry, he kind of was ready to move to town. So the doctor said, so it sounds like you might want to move to town. Henry nodded and said, but not a nursing home. I want my own place. And the doctor said, well, how would you like it if I lined up some healthcare people who can help you with the planning of a move and support you at home until you can make that change? You see, he said, how would you like it? You know, he didn't say, why don't you want to go to a nursing home? Nobody, you know, that's not the issue. Like, how would you like it if you help somebody make your goal? So the doctor made referrals to the following people for home health. Nursing for assessment and medication management and dating assistant. Social work for information about senior living facilities and community resources to support the move. PT for assessment for mobility, balance, and strength. OT for BABL, IABL assessment, and training, and assistive devices, and driving and senior mobility assessment. Now, there may be more, and, and when you go to breakout rooms, you can add to the picture. But these are the basics that we started with. So the doctor added, these people are here to help you meet your goal. If you want to bring them to see your apartment complex or your own home in town, they will help you do that. So we move on. Now we've got the people lined up. What assessments need to be done? So I've categorized the assessment tools into performance observation, self-report, and caregiver report. And I do want to um, show you this book that I use. This is Bortnick book on occupational therapy assessments for older adults. There's 100 instruments. And it's not just for OT. There are assessments in here that are for many professions for evaluating ADLs. And what's really nice is it's like two-page write-up on each assessment that analyzes the research and the psychometrics that have been developed and, and the information. So each one's like a page and a half. Um, very short for each one. But it tells you everything you need to know about the assessment and where to get permission or if permission is needed to access this. So this is by far the most valuable textbook I've ever used. I think in my teaching career, other than the physiology book that but this one's really great for assessment. And they're not just geriatric assessments, we some of them can be used. So I I started with a comprehensive assessment where we look at um, both BADLs and IADLs. So if the problem is that many people decline the invitation to do a home evaluation with them, I like to start with a home eval because I think that's most telling. Um, if they're declining a home evaluation because they're afraid the evaluator will put them in a nursing home, the solution is collaborative communication. So. I have had many incidents. I learned the hard way when I first started practice. I said, oh, here you're going home. How would you like me to come and do a home eval? I don't think so. <laughs> so I changed my tune and I finally figured out they're afraid that I'm going to tell them they can't go home. So instead, I asked what their goal is. And many of them will say, well, I want to go home or I want to stay home if they are already home. I said, well, if if going home is your goal, then I'm the person who's going to help you get there, and I'm the person who's going to help you stay there. I have instant trust from them every single time I've done this technique. They instantly trust it. And then I'll tell them, well, we typically do this by doing a home visit with you. Home visit, not home eval. Home visit. Before your actual discharge from here, so that we can suggest ideas that will make things easier and safer for you. How would you feel about that? But in no way am I going to tell you you have to do this or that. This is a collaborative visit. And they, they, every time I've done that, they've always done the home visit. 
they wanted to. Every time I said, how would you like a whole new out? And I would say 50% of the time it would be fine. So it took me a while to catch on to that. I didn't know what their underlying fear is, and they're not going to tell you what their fear is either. So during the home assessment, we assess every single room, and we look at their performance of their typical tasks in every single room. So the BADL, the IADL, et cetera. And then we use in we use collaborative intervention ideas. So I don't just do an assessment and make recommendations. I immediately do intervention simultaneously with the assessment processes. So for example, if they set their walker to the side and then step over to the refrigerator and open the door to get something out, I might ask them to have a seat and if it's okay if I borrow their walker to show them a little bit safer way to do that. And then I'll I'll demonstrate right then and there how they can keep the walker right at both hips and they can open the door and walk in with the walker. And then I might suggest a tray table and oftentimes I'll bring a tray table with me and let them try it out. And then they can um, transport kitchen items using that tray table. So for the interprofessional team, um, I actually had one facility that would not discharge anybody from the skilled nursing facility unless they had that home visit done, documented, and submitted to a county nursing team. So that was nice. I like that, that interprofessional collaboration. So we look at the performance observation. So again, with this comprehensive assessment, the PASS is a really good comprehensive tool of actual performance of both BADLs and IADLs. And um, the literature is newer and more contemporary. It's copyrighted, but you can access it after you do a really short, simple survey, which I did on their website. So that link is in there for you. But there are four domains with 26 core tasks. So it's functional ability, BADLs, IADLs, and then IADLs with cognitive tasks. So that's that's a newer one. The Tenetti Falls Efficacy Scale, this is now a self-report. It's not a performance operation, it's a self-report of their confidence. So if somebody does not have confidence in an ADL, they're not going to do the ADL, which can result in self-care neglect. And so it is important to assess their confidence with each ADL. Now, Tenetti is our old gold standard from 1990. But the new literature is still comparing to the Tenetti Falls Efficacy Scale, which is not the Falls Balance Assessment. This is the Falls Efficacy. It measures their confidence. So it's quick, easy screening tool. Um, it's available. For, it's free for clinical practice. The only disadvantage is it's hard sometimes for people to separate their confidence from their actual performance when they're reporting. Then we have a comprehensive assessment that can be done by patient or caregiver reports. So the ADL questionnaire is a very valuable tool. This is for people with no cognitive disorder. Uh, there are 28 items, and you can either have the patient or client report um, how well they're doing with each ADL, and if they're and, and you can also do the caregiver report, and then you can compare and contrast to see how aware the client is. Um, and if the client can't do self-report, then you can just use the, the caregiver report. This is valuable for determining how much assistance this person may need in the home. If they need 24-hour care, you can tell that to the caregiver. It sounds like this person needs around the clock care. How, what kind of resources do you and your family and neighborhood or friends have to provide 24-hour care? Well, then the family can say, hmm, we don't. Or, hmm, I think we can take shifts and I think we can hire respite. But then they can make those plans. So it's very helpful. The disadvantage is it's subjective. So now we'll go into specific tasks for B ADLs. And our most famous is the STEM functional independence measure. This is what most of us are familiar with who have been in um, connected with rehabilitation settings. 18 items in four ADL areas, self-care, mobility, locomotion, and communication. And this is the one where we measure if they need, if they um, 
the total assistance maps, maps assistance mod, minimal supervision or setup, and modified independence is if they can do it with an assistive device or if they're strictly independent. And this is typically the ones used in rehab settings. Um, it does interface well with the newborn what's developed by the newborn data system. So it interfaces well with a lot of electronic um, documentation systems and it's rec recognized by most disciplines. The COTS is another one. It's very old, but this is one that the newer assessments are still comparing to the COTS. So it's recognized by research um, as, as the main tool to assess. And this one, based, instead of looking at level of assistance, it looks at the number of ADLs that they can do independently. And it has extensive research with good integrator reliability, validity, consistency, and there's little no training, but there's a full and seeing effect, so it's not real sensitive. It is public domain um, and readily available, and there's contact information for that. This is a good one to compare your new ideas to if you're doing the research. The Barthel is another gold standard. 10 ADL items, a lot of research. Um, and this one is more sensitive to detect changes over time. So how do all those BADLs interface with the GP code? Well, we do the, those assessments and then we match them up with the G codes, the outcomes as best as we can to be independent, set up supervision or touching assistant, partial, moderate, um, substantial, and that's assist independent. All right, so that was the BADLs. So now we do the instrumental. Here we go back to the patient or caregiver report. The Lawton ID ADL scale is another one that's um, a gold standard. It has extensive evidence and reliability, and it's predictive of cognitive changes and falls, actually. Um, it, it's not real sensitive to check several changes over time. And then I put in um, an IADL assessment. I, I picked one in particular that indicates a lot of things. So community mobility is really important because it does impact their ability to get to the store, to get nutrition food, get to medical appointments for healthcare management or health management, excuse me, and to get out to senior citizens, which is exercise. Every time they go to the senior center, they're exercising their mind, body, spirit, emotions and keeping everything healthy. Church is the same thing, friends and family, because we know that if they're not connecting with friends and family, they're at risk of isolation, which leads to self-care and neglect. So it is important to address the community mobility through driving assessment. We also look at public transportation and their ability to access that and, and know the bus routes or whatever services are available. Can they get on and on, on and off the bus or in and out of a senior rider program car. Um, can they even access them? Can they use a phone? Can they hear to, to make an appointment to have senior rider to pick them up? Or affordability? All of these things um, indicate the interprofessional team. Social work's directly involved. What are the services that help them get to the grocery store and to the doctor? Um, OT is and PT and the primary care physician are implicated, nursing and dietary, because of the nutrition and the, the health management and behavioral health, uh, counselors, social workers, anybody that's connected with emotional well-being. Community mobility influences all of those things. All right, so we're going to return to the case of Henry, and we're going to do a quick breakout room for about eight minutes. Because of the primary care physician's therapeutic communication, Henry agreed to the assessments conducted in his home. In the meantime, Henry's son was helping Henry to find a small one-story condominium for those who are 50 or older. From the assessments we covered, which ones would be most appropriate for Henry? And I'm hoping everybody talked about the different roles of the interprofessional team members. Um, I see a lot of implications for all the team members, actually. Um, 
and I would like to see some of the other assessments for emotional well-being, cognitive well-being. They may not have to come right away immediately, or they might. It depends on what he said. He could say he's lonely. So there are definitely other assessments that we did not have time to cover. But what I'm hoping is the team can, somebody, the first person out, that goes out to see Henry can do a more comprehensive assessment and then share the results with the other team members who will do more specific follow-up assessments like for psychological well-being, cognitive and physical mobility, for example. So um, here's the results. Henry had weakness that made him feel unsafe to transfer in his pub. Nursing helped him bathe until he was able to get stronger and more stable with PT and to start using the tub bench safely with OT by sitting on it first and then swinging his legs over the edge of the tub. He could stand safely by using the new grab rail that his son put in and a gripper mat on the bottom of the tub. He also started dressing himself um, while sitting in a chair that had armrests, which made him also feel safer because he had been actually sleeping in his clothes because it was too hard to change at night and in the morning. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and that's not unusual. I've seen a lot of people that wear their same clothes for days on end because it's too hard to dress and undress. Dietary, physical therapy, occupational therapy worked with him on healthy cooking and safe kitchen mobility techniques that helped him transport the items while using a walker with a tray on it. Because how do you transport items when your hands have, both hands have to be on the walker? It becomes a tipping hazard. So they put a tray on it and taught him safe techniques. And he eventually progressed to a cane. So the outcomes is that Henry's son was able to move Henry to his new condo. As Henry got stronger, he was able to do longer distance walking with a cane. Social work helped him access meals on wheels one day a week, Monday through Friday, which was really valuable because then we knew for sure he was getting one well-balanced, healthy meal a day. And he still got exercise with making his own meals for breakfast and supper and snacks, and then full meals, um, three meals on a day on the weekend. So it didn't disable him by giving him meals on wheels. It actually enabled him. He had the health and nutrition and energy that he needed to make the other meals. And then that made him exercise and actually perform better. OT did a driving evaluation, found that his reaction time was actually too slow for safe driving. So then the OT worked with him on learning the bus routes and transferring in and out of the bus so he could use both community use the community mobility services and also the senior rider program. So Henry was eating better, which improved his cognition, but enabled him to manage his own medication and his bills and his bills. He wasn't paying his bills because his cognition was impaired and he knew it, but that he wasn't eating enough to actually be able to think and sequence and plan and do those higher executive functions. So once he was able to do his own medication management and his ADL, the home nursing was discontinued. He was able to walk longer distances, but PT was discontinued. He became independent in hygiene, bathing, grooming, and light meal preparation. So OT was discontinued. He began going to the senior fitness program that also offered community outings and coffee gatherings, which he really liked. Um, a lot of people I've seen, they just live for going, for example, to the YMCA for the, the coffee group. They love that. Although the pandemic has disrupted the, the gatherings, for example, a choice I won't see the older gentleman sitting in, or, or actually male and female, I won't see them sitting and drinking coffee as much there anymore. So I'm hoping they can get one with that again soon. Um, and then at his next annual wellness assessment, with his doctor, Henry stated he was enjoying life again and he was clean, shaven, smiling, over three. So out of the four M's, which ones were addressed in this case? We've got what matters. He was able to say what matters to him. What did matter to him the most? He wanted connections with people in town so he could do things. And that was the most important thing was moving into town. Uh, mentation. Did, was mentation in, affected in this case? 
Absolutely. His cognition was impaired because he wasn't eating and drinking as well as he, he could have been. Uh, mobility, was that an issue? Absolutely. He was having a hard time getting in and out of the car and he was having a hard time moving around. And he said, the less I do, the weaker I get. So that got better. And um, medication, nursing work with him on medication. So all of the four M's were addressed in this case. So in summary, we utilize the bank of evidence-based assessments for functional performance in BADLs to support independence and self-care. We identified evidence-based assessments for IADLs that, that help support aging in place wherever their preferred aging in place location is. And we talked about and, and applied effective therapeutic communication during assessment to support collaboration and especially trust, trust with older adults. So um, effective communication is very much part embedded in the overall assessment process, and it can make or break the ability for an older adult to accept help from healthcare professionals. 